This is a story about an American hero. It's a story of courage, grit, and perseverance. It's a story of Lance P. Sijon, class of 1965, the only Air Force Academy graduate to have been awarded the Medal of Honor. His story has inspired generations of USAFA cadets and graduates. My name is Jimmy Butler. I'm a member of the graduate class of 1963, fifth graduating class at the Academy. I have this story to tell because I was a little closer to the scene at the time than most people. I was a forward air controller flying little Cessna 01s and 02s over the Ho Chi Minh Trail, basically all of 1967. And Lance Saijan was shot down in November of 1967 in an area that I flew probably once every week, every 10 days. Lance Saijon took off from Da Nang Air, Force Air Base in South Vietnam, had come all the way up to this area, and they were striking. This represents the border between Laos and Laos and North Vietnam. So they were striking just this inside of this near the Van Boy Ford, which was one of the most heavily defended targets in, in Laos. The story started in the middle of the night of 9 November, 10 November, where he had flown up in a flight of two F-4s out of Da Nang Air Base in northern part of South Vietnam. So they had come up about 100 miles. They actually were shot down in Laos, which was a secret war at the time. Uh, a lot of people even were over there in the war had no idea what we were doing over Laos. North Vietnam went from here on up. This was a demilitarized zone. This was South Vietnam. And to support the war in the South that they were gonna do in guerrilla warfare, they couldn't just come to the DMZ. They didn't really have a Navy to come and support operations in South Vietnam. They could bring some stuff in through Cambodia and get over. <clears throat> but the natural fit for them was to come over into Laos. What I heard was they, they were dropping on a target a little farther east, about eight miles west of the North Vietnamese border. And the first aircraft came in and dropped. He came off, the second one came in, which Lance was in. And supposedly, the fact said, you know, they came down and apparently there was some indication that they got hit because you wouldn't, I've flown in the dark out there, it's very dark every Laos in the jungle, and you wouldn't have been able to see that much, but probably there was some fire involved with the airplane. But they said, came in to, for the drop, went up high, and then just kind of arced over and went back in. This is Mugia Pass, this is the next pass down, and he was shot down, I guess this represents the border. He was just around where that loop is in that road. He was just right about there. I think Lance ended up on the south side of the road, so I think the wind probably carried his chute, but we had facts right there, people ready to acknowledge, you know, anybody that called. There was no indication that either pilot got out of the airplane. Uh, normally with your parachutes, you had a beeper in the, in the riser, so when the riser extended, it started this beeper warbling on the emergency frequency. There were no beepers heard from either chute. So the indications were that probably neither one got out, but you don't know. The next morning I was assigned a morning flight and patrolling a sector of the main part of the trail about 50 miles west of where he was shot down. And Crown was a call sign and every 30 minutes or so you'd hear Crown call and guard, which was emergency frequency. That AWOL, if you hear this come up on guard. There was no response whatsoever. I heard this over about two or three hours. I could look to the east and the, they, he was shot down near the border, which was a ridge of mountains. And so where he was shot down was in the mountains compared to where I was over the valley. And um, the clouds were right down on the mountains. So every time I heard that and I would look over to the east, I would think, if he comes up on the radio, we're gonna have trouble getting into it. We would have tried, but he did not come up on the radio. Now, he'd only been down seven, 10 hours or so. He had some pretty severe injuries. He had a head injury, he had his crushed hand. Uh, I think one of his legs had a broken bone in it. So 
him, he would have not been feeling great by then. Uh, the following morning, which was November 11th, with Veterans Day, uh, my squadron commander, Colonel Pallister, was the first back out, back to that area, and the weather was clear. And as soon as he flew into the area, Lance came up on the radio. That would indicate that he probably waited until he heard an aircraft nearby. So Colonel Pallister was there, initially the on-scene commander, and uh, waited until they came up. He briefed the incoming Sandy commander, um, who was going to take over the rescue at that point, that this was a very hot area. It was a fairly new road the North Vietnamese had built, and a lot of their truck traffic came down through there. During a big rescue like that, the planes came from here. There were rescue helicopters at Udorn, rescue helicopters at Da Nang, and so they all converged on the area that morning to try to get him out. About early afternoon, maybe 1 to 1.30, they had a helicopter right over him. They could see ground troops on three different sides that weren't firing. He was asking to get a PJ, pararescue guy, sent down to help him because he was injured, which was true. And uh, they evaluated the situation, and at that point they decided he probably had already been captured, and that they were using the radios and forcing him to try to get more people in, try to get a PJ down. One more guy captured or killed, they end up calling off rescue, which had been done. Not a lot, because they were gonna try for as long as there was a good chance they could get him, but they felt they weren't gonna be able to. The jungle is not like the mountains here in Colorado and the woods. It's much different, and there are a lot of hiding places, but if you got a lot of people, you know, there's a good chance they're gonna find you when they know generally where you are. And so, as I told the cadets, probably had people that close to him, and in a survival situation, you can't move, you know, any movement's what's going to get you caught. He's got these severe injuries. It's not going to be easy just to lay there quietly while somebody walks by. But if that happened, and likely it did, uh, you know, he, he didn't let them find him. Eventually he was found near the road, uh, passed out by a passing truck driver saw him and supposedly he was about seven miles from where he started. So that was over about six weeks. You know, he was not in condition, and when you look at the sculptor out there, the sculptor shows what it would have been like, and so he would have been crawling most of that. And so he did evade longer than anybody would have expected in that condition. He was taken to North Vietnam, and he supposedly just fought him the whole time, even though he couldn't do anything, and died about a month after from that treatment. Of course, none of us knew that was him at the time, and it was only afterwards when we start putting this together and say, okay, that was the day that he was at F-4 pilot. When I talked to cadets, I'd try to tell them, hey, you're gonna run into stuff this summer that you think's pretty tough. Nothing compared. So I try to get across to them that if you ever really think you wanna quit this, give some thought to him on what he went through, and he didn't quit.